for the majority of us, I think none of us like to make mistakes. And if we do make a mistake, we like to make it in private so that no one knows. We don't like making mistakes that people see. Um, so if we do have to be kind of humiliated, you know, the fewer people that know about the thing, the better. You know what I mean? If you're up in your room and you misunderstand something and only you saw it or knew it, that's absolutely fine. If the whole world becomes aware of something that you didn't know or didn't, weren't aware of, uh, it can be very, very embarrassing. Um, when any of us who have been in communities uh, that aren't necessarily English speaking will have had this experience on numerous occasions when you're learning a language and you know enough of the language to make catastrophic errors. You know, when, you're, when, you're, when you know nothing, it's fine, you don't understand anything. But then you get to the stage where you, you half know a language, so then you know enough to confuse words or get the word wrong and say things that you really did not mean to say at all. So I remember one particular experience, I was in the chapel, I was a novice, I was two, three, three, two or three years in the community at this stage. So Blessed Sacrament was exposed, candles were lit, it was all beautiful and solemn. And my intention uh, was just to, to thank God for all the gifts that he gives us. Right? Thank you, Lord, for all the gifts. That was my intention. I was speaking in Italian. Um, so the word for, for, for a gift is a dono. Just I didn't say that. I didn't say dono. I missed. I got the gender of the word wrong. So I said donna, which means woman. So I said, Lord, thank you for all the women that you give us every day, <laughs> and we pray that we can use them according to your holy will. <laughs> and at that point, some of the sisters were in such hysterics that they had to. Leave. I still didn't know what I said wrong. Uh, God, I was like, what? What? And then the sisters had to leave, giggling away, and some of the brothers were exploding down the back. And and you're still there with the, what's going? What's going? Why? Why is everybody laughing? <laughs> okay, one of many. There are, we have when we start telling these stories in our community, we can go on for hours about mistakes that we've made. Um, oh, our mother superior, um, she went for a little rest in the afternoon. When she woke up, she had you know you get those line down your face from the way your the way the pillow sits, right? She had this kind of a crease on her face, and um, I'm not 100 percent sure how the German works in this, uh, but one of the sisters said. Oh, Madre, you've got a line down your face, right? And she wanted to say from the cushion. But cushion in German is kissen, which sounds like something else in English, right? So she got it. She said, oh, Madre, you've got a line down your face from kissing, basically, is what she said. Kissen. Oh, she, said, she, gave the, she put the umlaut in it. Yeah. So you have a line down your face from kissen instead of kissen. Really. Anyway, so Madre, you've got a line down your face from kissing. Like, you know, these kind of things happen all the time, and it's, it's a lot of fun embarrassing at the same time. Sometimes in our spiritual lives, in fact very often in our spiritual lives, the Lord allows failure to teach us something greater, to teach us something better. In our lives the Lord can allow failure to teach us humility, which isn't, it, this is not a bad thing, this isn't the Lord abandoning us, this isn't the Lord uh, leaving us to our own devices and sitting back and laughing. This is the Lord allowing us to see that on our own we can't do anything. You know, as St. Paul, St. Paul so beautifully writes in, in, in Philippians 4.13, like, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. The opposite of that is I can do all things myself. Now, I can do all things myself is disastrous because you can't. The reality is you can't. So you can try but you're going to fail. And in fact, if that's your attitude, you need to fail. If you're going to try everything on your own, you need to fail in order to learn that we need God. Because how on earth could we get to heaven thinking, Lord, I made it here all on my own. And now that I'm here in heaven, I'm amongst my equals, awesome people just like me. Like, oh, no way. Like that, that simply could not be the case. We will get to heaven because of God's grace and spend all eternity thanking him for what he has done in us. So at times we need to fall off our high horse. And it's an, it's, an, it's an actual gift. It's a gift to be reminded of our need for God. So when, when the Lord, like in this beautiful description today from the Acts of the Apostles of, of Paul's conversion, like it, they make no bones at all about what, what Saul before his conversion, saw what Saul was doing. Saul was still breathing threats to slaughter the Lord's disciples. This, this, like he, his name would have struck fear into the hearts of all Christians. Imagine like if Oliver Cromwell one day, right, after 
destroying who knows how many monasteries, decides to have a conversion or decides to fall off his horse on the way to Bally Macarbury or something. And, you know, and then he's on his way to Dungarvan. You can imagine Dungarvan, no, 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 he's not coming here, he's not coming here, <laughs> no, no way. And, you know, and so he meets some holy person there and they, they, you can imagine like the, the hesitation with which they'd welcome him. They said, no, well, no, sorry, not, not so much the hesitation with which they'd welcome him, the disdain that they would have for him. Then lo and behold, he has this conversion experience and scales fall off his eyes, metaphorically speaking. And right after, it's, it's, the, the, the change is so quick. He had only spent a few days with the disciples in Damascus when he began preaching in the synagogues. What did he start preaching? Jesus is the Son of God. Again, these, these terms and words are so common in our language. They're, they're so familiar to us. This is revolutionary, right? For a, a Jew to say that Jesus is a son of God, you're saying that he's equal to God. I mean, the son of a cat is a cat. The son of a dog is a dog. The son of God is, is, is God. Huh? That's, that's a problem because we believe in one God. So how, how do we do this? How do we have one God and yet there's God the Father and God the Son, but there's one God. I don't know how to... And then someone says, yeah, there's the Holy Spirit as well. Oh, no. Oh, come on. <laughs> Hang on now. Oh, hold on. Hold on a second. So, you know, you can imagine, like, it, this, this, wasn't, this wasn't so easy to grapple with at the beginning. Like, it felt like... Her this would have felt like heresy initially. You know, we believe in one God, but there's two of them. Uh, so, so this is huge. This is huge. But the Lord had to allow Paul, Saul, to have this experience of <clears throat> falling off his high horse. And... Uh, we need this too. The failures in our lives aren't, they're not necessarily abandonment from God. In fact, they're not abandonment from God. They can be our greatest learning experiences. In fact, our need for forgiveness, our need for God's mercy, the experience of our own sinfulness, not that we would ever encourage sin, of course not, but when I'm aware of my sinfulness, this can be a great teacher to me. You know, when I'm starting to feel a bit better than other people, then I realize, or I remember my last confession, or my need for confession now. And this, this, this realization that I need God's mercy will make me a much more effective missionary because I'm not gonna preach down to people. I need God's mercy. I need his healing. In today's gospel, just one word on it, if I may, uh, We've been building up to this for the whole week. John chapter 6, so this, this famous discourse on, on the Eucharist. And it's been, it's been building up slowly. Yesterday, uh, things finally broke, if you will. Um, he was speaking about the Father and the Son. That's how it's all. It's all good. It's all very nice. You know, no one can come to me unless he's drawn to him, unless he is drawn by the Father who sent me, and I'll raise him up in the last day. Can imagine all oh, this is beautiful, it's lovely. Yeah, the Father drawing people to me. That's all nice. Okay. Uh, he who comes to me will never be hungry. Who believes me will never thirst. It's all. It's all lovely. But then he starts getting to this kind of uncomfortable territory. All right. Your father's eight men in the desert. And they're dead. Right, so Jesus, like, he's just, <laughs> he's laying it out. He says it again today. But this is the bread come down from heaven, so that a man may eat it and not die. Eat, sorry, eat, eat bread and, 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 and not die, like ever. What, what, what are you talking about? Because obviously he's not talking about bread, bread. So what, what's he talking about? I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread, me, will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. That is so uncomfortable. That's, that's yesterday's gospel, okay? And just in case it wasn't clear, here we go. I tell you most solemnly, if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life within you. Anyone who does eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in him. As I, who am sent by the living Father, myself draw life from the Father, so whoever eats me will draw life from me. Five times back to back. 
this is not a mere symbol. Like it could, it, it could not be clearer. Like this is just no way of saying he's speaking metaphorically or it's just five times back to back. Like this, it, it, couldn't be, it couldn't be clear, really couldn't be clear. The Lord is saying, and you can just imagine the atmosphere at the time. He healed people. He did nice things. He walked on water. He multiplied loaves and fish. We saw the blind man, and now he's, he can see again. We saw the lame man, now he's walking again. We've heard of all the stories that he, he worked, the work, miracles that he worked here, there, and everywhere. Now he wants us to eat him. That's crazy. That's, that's just crazy. That's, ha, how do you, wh why, where, toenail, what? Like, what? Oh, it's like, it's just, how, how do, everything was going so well up until this point. And now it just seems just completely to go to pot. This makes no sense. Like, are you calling us to cannibalism or what? Like, you can just imagine, like, the, even the, the, like we were saying yesterday, the apostles as well, looking on going, how do, we, how, do we, how do we defend this? How do we explain this? How do we protect Jesus from people who are now going to call him crazy or a cannibal? Or, or how, do we, how do we understand this at all? And this is in a way, like an, an act of, of, of humility from the Lord, because he, he knew they wouldn't understand. In a way, they, maybe, maybe in, in a way they couldn't understand yet. Okay, not all the pieces of the puzzle had been put on the table yet. So we've got the, the, all this Old Testament preparation for the Passover and the Lamb and so on and so forth. And even John points him out, this is the, behold the Lamb of God. But like, it hadn't all been stuck together now with the, with the, the experience of Easter. So the, Jesus being the Lamb of God, the new Lamb of God in the new covenant. This is my body offered for you, given up for you. So the Eucharist and, and the Passover coming together, this hadn't happened yet. But just the absolute humility of Jesus to say something. You know, you can imagine when people are happy to see you and crowds coming and people talking about your, your miracles and, and, and it, it's, it would have been good to go from town to town and, and experience that, that welcome. And then because you're going to say something like this, you know people are going to call you crazy, but it's true, so you do it anyway. You know, Jesus, he's just so humble. He's just so humble. Like he doesn't care about popularity. Doesn't care. So it's a, it's, it's a beautiful teaching on, on, so ma on so many levels. I mean, you could go into just the, the, the depth of, of the sacramental life, of, of living in the Eucharist. Eucharist being... Yeah, that, that wonderful expression used so often by moms, you know, you are what you eat. When they see their kids drinking Coke and eating crisps, or do you want, do you want to turn into a big Mars bar, do you? Hmm? You know, that kind of thing, you are what you eat. Like, so, well, if you are what you eat, then, then if we consume the Eucharist, if we consume Jesus, is that not what we're supposed to become? You know, we who from the beginning created in God's image and likeness were supposed to become Christ-like Christians taken into his mystical body. And again, not just, not just in kind of a, a distant metaphor, but to actually be taken into the heavenly reality, taken, in, taken into God. The Eucharist opens up. It, it opens up scripture. It, it, it opens up... Like it's the source and summit of our faith, of the Christian life. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your infinite humility in giving yourself to us, not just in your humanity, but in the Eucharist as food. Lord, we apologize in the name of all of those who have received you unworthily. We apologize also for any occasions where we have received you unworthily. For all the sacrileges com committed against the Eucharist. For those who receive you as a mere thing or as an inanimate object or as a mere symbol. Lord, we thank you for this sacrament of love 
that you've poured yourself out, that we can come so, so close to you, that we don't gaze on you from a distance, but that you love us from inside us. You transform us from the inside out. Lord Jesus, renew our love for you. Renew our spirit of adoration. Renew our reverence for the Eucharist. Because your flesh is real food and your blood is real drink. Amen.